Gospel of Luke. It's a gospel that is distinctive in many ways. It contains stories and parables that are not found in Matthew or Mark or in John. Only in Luke's gospel do we find the story of the prodigal son, the story of the Good Samaritan, the story of the ten lepers, the lost sheep, in fact, there are 18 different parables and stories that we find only in Luke's Gospel. Luke gives weight in his writing to the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, who plays an active role in the birth of Christ all the way through the resurrection, and who figures heavily in the sequel to Luke's Gospel, which we know as the Book of Acts. Luke's Jesus is a hungry Jesus, for he's found often at table with others, and much of the ministry of Jesus revolves around food. I had a student who one time said that Luke's Jesus is a Methodist Jesus, <laughs> because he spent so much time eating. In fact, so prevalent is this theme that during our Wednesday morning devotionals, we're going to explore those stories a little bit more in depth. And it is Luke, more so than any other gospel writer, who shines a light on the relationship between Jesus and the marginalized, often raising them to positions of dignity and equality. Women, Samaritans, Gentiles, tax collectors, and especially the poor, the Gospel of Luke is a gospel that is filled with social justice through and through. We are going to focus during this Lenten season on another of the major themes in Luke's Gospel, and that is the theme of forgiveness and reconciliation. I deliberately chose this topic for such a time as this, when we as a country, as a community, 
as a denomination, as a local church, are in need of a path towards reconciliation. Not only with one another, but sometimes even within our own selves. And so we begin today with the story of the woman who anoints the feet of Jesus. What do we know about this woman? Well, Luke tells us that she's a sinner. She's described as one who has sinned. We know from the story that she is an uninvited guest to the dinner, but rather joins the party, regardless of invitation or not. We know from this story that she speaks not a single word, but allows rather her actions to speak volumes. She anoints the feet of Jesus with expensive oil and washes his feet with her tears and her hair. Just imagine, if you will, what that might look like. To wash someone's feet with your tears and with your hair. These are acts of humility and honor and pure love. The actions of this woman take the expected hospitable gestures to a new level of expression. And we know that Jesus acknowledges these actions, which, by the way, would be the usual thing to do. These, these expressions of hospitality would be normal. There should be no need to comment on them, and yet Jesus acknowledges them and raises them to a level not of servitude, but to a level of deep and profound love. He speaks to this uninvited woman words of kindness and affirmation and reminds her that her sins are already forgiven. The Greek shows us that the woman's sins have already been forgiven, that the forgiveness is not a result of her actions but comes before. In other words, this woman did not buy forgiveness with her alabaster jar and her tears. Rather, those actions are loving expressions of gratitude for forgiveness already received. So it's no wonder that we desperately want to make this story all about the woman. We want to identify with this woman. We want to put ourselves in her place. We want to take away the lesson from this story that all of us have been forgiven much and we would do well to be forgiving towards others. That's what we want. That would be easy. It's a neat little package all tied up with a go forth and forgive others because God in Christ has forgiven you and has set you free to live fully into the beautiful nature of your humanity. And that might be enough challenge for us today. But maybe there's something deeper. Maybe there's a challenge that we're not willing to see in this story. Because this passage in Luke's Gospel is a tale of two sinners and the response of Jesus to each one. It is this character contrast that Luke pushes us to that place of discomfort. As I studied and, and prepared for this week, I, I took several Bibles, several print Bibles that I have. And most of them are the kind of Bible that provide a summary title to each section of the narrative. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? As you thumb through your Bible, you'll notice a, a little section that sums up what you're about to read. It gives a title, like a title to a book. They're descriptive titles, and they're not put there by Luke. They're not put there by the author. They're rather added to the Bible afterwards by editors. One Bible called this the actions of a loving woman. Another one called this the woman who loved much. Another, a woman who was forgiven. 
Not a single title that I read in any of the Bibles I looked at, not a single one pointed to Simon. And I wonder what would happen if that summary title that we read before we went into this story was this, The Man Who Struggles With Forgiveness. That man, of course, is Simon the Pharisee, the one who invited Jesus to dinner, who opens his home and his table to Jesus. For what purpose? We don't know. Luke offers no information as to the motivation of Simon the Pharisee, but we can wonder together if his invitation was not somehow to test Jesus, to demonstrate Simon's superiority and status and wealth and knowledge. Certainly that would not be out of character for a Pharisee. For throughout Scripture, we notice a tension between the Pharisees and Jesus, a questioning of Jesus. Who is this man? By what authority does he do this? In fact, we read that question at the end of our story today. If the motivation of Simon was to demonstrate his perceived superiority over Jesus, the presence of this sinful woman gives him even more opportunity to do so. Because Simon is deeply critical, even if internally, he is deeply critical that Jesus would allow himself to be anointed, to be touched by such a sinful woman. A sinner, bad enough, but a woman, even worse. Jesus tells a parable that simply demonstrates by analogy to financial debt that the more one is forgiven, the more one responds with gratitude and then explains to Simon that the woman's actions of lavish love are because she had believed herself to be a sinner and had experienced the freedom of forgiveness and was expressing that freedom in acts of gratitude and devotion. It was Simon's responsibility to show hospitality to Jesus. I want you to hear that. Simon is the one who introduced and invited Jesus into this dinner party. It was his responsibility to show hospitality, to provide, as was the custom, water for the washing of the feet, it was Simon's place to greet Jesus with a holy kiss, and none of that happened. Simon failed in his role as a host to the Son of God. And, and then to make matters worse, not only does he fail to do this, he fails to acknowledge his failure. And then to take another step down the worst trail, he deflects the shame onto the woman. It was Simon who stood in need of forgiveness and the grace of God, and rather what he chooses to do is to shine the light of judgment on another. Maybe Luke's intent in writing this story in this way is for us to identify not with the woman, but with Simon, with the Pharisee who struggles with forgiveness, who is unable to acknowledge his own sinfulness and instead finds comfort or superiority or something in pointing out the unworthiness of others. Have you ever been a Simon? I have. It's a, it's a mechanism that we as human beings use so very often. We get caught in something, and we immediately point to someone else who is worse than us. We cast shame on someone else because we're unable to acknowledge our own sinfulness. We vilify others who don't think like us, who don't act like us, 
in order to redirect attention away from our own brokenness. And I wonder if that's not the really difficult message of this passage. That's the discomforting message that we are all, at some point in our life, a Simon. And I think if we're willing to put ourselves in that place, not in the place of the woman who lavishes love upon Christ, but rather for a moment to put ourselves and reflect on the way that we have been Simon, I wonder if we might take away several lessons. The first being that before Jesus, before the perfection of Jesus, all of us are sinners. None of us have the right to claim a moral high ground. All of us are in need of the grace of God. A second takeaway that I see is that our unwillingness to declare and acknowledge our own sinfulness is in itself a sin. And it often leads to this attitude and this action of deflecting judgment onto others. Let me ask you that during this Lenten season, when you find yourself judging others, stop a minute and ask yourself what's really going on here. Am I deflecting judgment onto others so that I don't have to acknowledge my own sinfulness? Another takeaway is that our unwillingness to declare and acknowledge our own sinfulness it creates a barrier to experiencing the beautiful fullness of God's grace towards us. This woman, I, I will con confess an envy towards this woman because this woman in our story today understood what it meant to be free. She was so free that she was willing to break into a dinner uninvited and to lavish expensive oil on the feet of her Savior. I want to I experience that kind of freedom. We all should want to experience that kind of freedom. And I think perhaps the, the most profound lesson of this story, if we're willing to shift our view just a bit, I think the most profound lesson of this story is that perhaps our very best teachers in the faith might be found in the people we have set aside as other, as somehow less than. It was the woman, the sinful woman, the other, the less than in this story that teaches us about gratitude and grace and freedom and forgiveness. In Luke's Gospel, throughout Luke's Gospel, if we're open to it, we can find ourselves learning the most profound lessons from the most unexpected people. Unexpected because we ourselves have already judged them as non-deserving of grace, of love, of inclusion, of opportunity, of basic human rights. And it is often, in Luke's Gospel, the one who is set aside by the world, who is the most pure in heart. True in Luke, and maybe even true in life. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, open our eyes that we might see. That we might see all people as you see them. Marvelously created, deserving of love and grace and healing and forgiveness. God, open our hearts that we might be willing to look into our own souls and be willing to declare and acknowledge our own brokenness without shining the light of judgment on someone else, without deflecting blame, or the light of Christ that shines. Let that be our Lenten journey, O oh God, today and always. 
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We come to this time of offering, and it is an act of worship when we give. Not only of our gifts to God, but also of ourselves. Of a renewed commitment, of a renewed love, of a renewed joy. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, accept that which we give today. Accept our treasures and our commitment of faith and heart to you. And use that which we give for your purposes so that your kingdom may be seen here on earth as it truly is in heaven. We ask all things in the name of the one who saves us, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 